Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. Thank you for coming to PM&R Grand Rounds. Uh, information for CME and credits have been up here, and uh, we'll flash it again at the end. Uh, to start with, uh, I'm going to invite up uh, Stephanie Heiser and Paul Ricard. Uh, as you know, we start off uh, Grand Rounds with about a uh, about an eight to ten minute presentation on quality improvement works within the department. Um, and so thank you for uh, Paul and Stephanie for presenting. If there are other people who are interested in presenting quality improvement works or other elements that they're doing in the department in this short session, if they could please contact myself or Sam Mayer and we'll get you on the schedule. We're always looking for great projects. So Paul and Stephanie. So Paul and I are going to be talking about a quality improvement project that we started in January of 2016 on our cardiac surgery service. So sternal precautions, which are often given to patients following a median sternotomy, um, have historically been around for years. They're considered standard of care. Um, many people believe that they uh, result in difficulty with home reintegration. Um, and at Johns Hopkins, our traditional sternal precautions before this QI project were very much on the conservative side, um, where patients were restricted to not lift any, uh, anything greater than 10 pounds, as well as no lifting their arms, both arms above their head at the same time. So this really limited their mobility as well as, the, as, well as their ADLs. Um, so this kind of um, evolved into this QI project where I began seeing these clinical scenarios where I had patients that needed assistance with getting out of bed or transferring from a chair, but then once they were up and able to walk, they did not need any physical assistance. Um, however, this became a barrier to um, discharge planning where, especially if patients didn't have assistance at home, um, many of these patients would be recommended for rehab versus going home. And um, I felt that if they were actually able to use their arms, then they could potentially go home instead of to rehab, saving um, a lot of money. <laughs> so um, looking at our QI timeline, everything kind of started at this uh, retrospective chart review that I did during January and February of 2016. Um, the purpose of this chart review was to identify the percentage of patients going to rehab facilities that may benefit from liberalization of sternal precautions. Um, this was done by looking at 50 patients and looking at uh, the following outcome measures, the activity measure for post-acute care and patient mobility short form, as well as the Johns Hopkins highest level of mobility, which many of us are familiar with these measures here at Hopkins, um, as well as looking at discharge location. Uh, the results were 10 of the 50 patients were discharged to rehab, and three of these 10 patients discharged to rehab were actually meeting an HLM goal of eight, meaning that they were able to walk 250 feet on the unit. So did those patients really need to be going to rehab if they were walking this level of distance? Um, so as we know from previous studies here at Hopkins, there is this correlation between AMPAC and discharge location. Um, as well as we saw a significant difference between our AMPAC with the group of patients that was discharged home versus those discharged to rehab. However, what we did not see was a significant difference in the patient's observed level of mobility throughout the course of their hospitalization, which kind of supported our theory that potentially we were restricting our patients with their functional mobility. So this really engaged um, our cardiac surgeons and our intensivists um, by looking at this pilot data and showing them this, as well as nursing management, because um, we wanted to kind of ease nursing care burden as well, making our patients more independent with um, all their ADLs as well as mobility. Um, and then obviously from a therapist standpoint, uh, we were easy buy-in because we want our patients to be independent and we want them going home and not to rehab. So Paul and I um, 
met and went over how can we make our sternal precautions more liberal yet still be supported by the literature that was available. And so we decided to increase the lifting restriction to 20 pounds so patients were able to um, use their arms a lot more for functional tasks as well as ADLs. Um, addition additionally, being able to use their upper extremities however they needed to for ADLs, such as lifting above head, both arms above head if they needed to for washing their hair, um, as well as tying their shoes. Um, the main thing was being able to use their arms for getting out of bed and transfers, which is uh, the really important thing that we wanted to change. Um, so this is a video of how we are now instructing our patients with getting out of bed. So clearly being able to use their arms to facilitate that task. Um, we educated our therapists through um, staff meetings as well as performing a competency checkoff. And then uh, education for nursing and clinical technicians was um, provided by nurse leadership as well as reinforced through multidisciplinary interaction. Um, patient education was um, revised in the, the patient educa education binders that were provided to them after the surgery and then uh, reinforced through therapists, PT and OT, as well as nursing, ClinTechs, and then mid-level providers. So next, Paul is going to talk about our next phase. So the next phase of things that we're looking into is trying to figure out what are some of the barriers to people actually uh, perform these sternal precautions. Um, what we wanted to do first off is figure out, uh, did the patients know the sternal precautions? Uh, so we came up with a, with a short survey here that looks at the four main points of why uh, the sternal precautions changes that we did, as well as this last question to try to look at, is there differences among the providers? We saw if these are uh, weeks across the bottom, um, percentages across the, the top. Um, that we saw that patients uh, didn't uh, retain a lot of the information that we were teaching them. That's interesting, we didn't really have a lot of research looking at um, what the retention rate is for education, so we're not quite sure what, what that could be. Um, but we had increasing uh, over time that the patients knew their external precautions. Um, interestingly enough, I think around week 11, while there's a slight jump in there, we started, instead of taking every patient uh, on the step-down unit, we actually narrowed it down to people within 24 hours of discharge. Um, so that does make sense for people that are closer to the discharge might know their sternal precautions better. Um, we also looked at the questions, um, sort of to, to delineate where do we need to spend time in our education. Uh, question number four over here, which is the lowest uh, value, was the using your arms to get in and out of bed. Uh, we've been working with the uh, staff downstairs in the ICU as well as the staff upstairs to try to figure out why is this the case. Uh, one of the things that we're potentially looking at is the fact that um, nurses upstairs really don't know what 20 pounds is. Uh, so we're going to be using that in terms of the future to figure out how to educate them on what 20 pounds is. Uh, despite the sort of variability of, uh, of the response rate, um, uh, the patient's question number five did feel that we were given consistent education on that, which is kind of counterintuitive based on, uh, based on the knowledge. <coughs> We also wanted to figure out, did the staff know this information? Um, and as you can see, the CVPCU, the step-down unit, is on the top, and the ICU is the bottom line. Um, there was a general trend, trend to an increasing or maintenance level of education of the staff. If the staff isn't, doesn't know the education material, that could be one of the reasons why the patients don't know it. So we're trying to demonstrate um, that the staff did also know this education. So again, moving forward with things, we're looking for consistency of patient education among all providers. So we have written inform information in the binders. We have verbal information, uh, which is, appears to be relatively consistent, and what we're missing is some visual information. So we went through the process of creating a video that we've now uploaded, and I think as of maybe yesterday or earlier this week, it should be available on TigerNet, which then we can get our patients to watch. You get this consistency of ed education. So there is some variability between providers. We've also had some problems with staff turnover. Um, we've been very lucky on the rehab service, inpatient rehab service team. We haven't had a lot of turnover, especially on the cardiac service, but um, the nursing staff has had a significant amount of turnover, so we're having some difficulties in terms of how do you consistently train the nurses to be able to do this. And then that last thing there, that bullet about lack of education. Um, so we can think about a response rate to a survey of 30%. Everyone stands up and cheers. Uh, I'm not quite sure what an education response rate is. So I'm not quite sure what patients, what a recall of precautions is for, for patients. So I need to look into that literature as well as sort of uh, use hours to, to put something out there to determine what is a good um, recall rate for them. So again, we have the video. Uh, we're going to be re-educating the providers upstairs. We're thinking about putting some uh, signs uh, up in the room on 10 West, as well as, again, re-auditing um, the, um, the providers upstairs to figure out uh, uh, is their knowledge level maintaining at that 80% where they were before. 
Uh, we were slightly short on our time, so I'm not quite sure if people had any other questions. We have more slides up here, but I'm trying to condense 15 into eight. One of the, so we, we do use a, the visual presentation. We talk about a small dog or a kitchen chair in terms of using the sort of common objects for, for patients. We've also brought a scale in next to the bed and said you can push into the scale and that gives an idea of what 20 pounds is. Um, but when you tell them a gallon of milk is eight pounds, so you can lift two gallons of milk, they go, oh, and that's a lot of weight. And I think people uh, mispresent what, what 20 pounds is. So we're going to look. We're going to look. We're going to look. Um, we're going to take one more look at the uh, at the uh, providers to make sure they're knowing things and at the education of of, uh, of the patients to make sure we're we're at the same place or at a plateau. And then yes, we're going to be looking back uh, prospectively at the at the patients and their discharge. Yes, and complications potentially, because we did look at that before. The complication rate I think was about two percent, um, and it's been that way for about for as long as as women could remember. And that's the same across institutions as well. And there's variation in what other um, hospitals do for sternal precautions, so. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Peter uh, Vagavan. Peter is a disability scientist. Uh, <laughs> who I know now for many years. Uh, we've been um, always meeting in the, in the, in the National Vietnam meetings uh, um, in the context of uh, the rehabilitation medicine science training program that a uh, few of, of us have done here in, in Hopkins and are pretty happy to participate in that, in that uh, group. So, um, Today is going to talk about uh, stroke recovery. Uh, a couple of words about her. She's uh, she trained under Einstein in New York, and then she uh, did her residency in rehabilitation medicine at Mount Sinai. And uh, she, after that, remained in Mount Sinai, uh, doing uh, as an assistant professor, uh, doing research under the care award. And uh, John Krakauer, who's in the lab, was uh, one of her primary mentors. And um, so she remained in Monsanto for working on Columbia research, and then uh, more, more recently moved to NYU. She's an uh, associate professor and has been here and she's a lecture for research in the Shabbat uh, Institute. Uh, so uh, we're very happy uh, to have you here and we're going to talk about strong and strong. So um, I got some a wonderful tour of your facilities today, and uh, uh, you know it's, it's a very exciting place to be. Um, so, so I'm going to talk to you also on the use of upper limbs and barriers, uh, and potential solutions to fix some of these barriers. Um, I need to disclose that I'm co-founder um, and scientific consultant of a company called Mirrored Motion Works um, and another company called Movies, um, and that I will be talking about the off-label use of hyaluronidase for muscle stiffness, for which NYU has filed a patent, but I haven't received any funds from uh, all of this uh, uh, commercial work. and. Um, also, no, none of the work I am going to present has been funded by a commercial entity. Um, so really, my objective is to discuss the barriers to stroke recovery and to define some strategies to overcome these barriers. Um, so I'm sure all of you who treat stroke or do research uh, will agree with me that you know, the upper limb is a particular barrier to recovery of quality of life. Because if you have hemiparesis and you're using a cane or a walker, you know, both your limbs are used up. Uh, essentially, one limb is, is not usable and the other is used up. You can't really do very much. Um, and this was a problem that struck me during my training in residency, uh, which I thought is really strange. You know, so much of our brain is devoted to arm and hand function, 
And yet, 86% of survivors have persistent dysfunction. Um, so the question was, can we actually fix this? Can we get to a point where someone has very little movement and use of their arm and actually restore functional use? And if so, how? Um, so this has been the focus of my uh, work in research as well as clinical work. Um, and I established the Motor Recovery Research Lab uh, when I was at Mount Sinai, where we measure uh, movement kinematics and muscle activity and fingertip forces, like, the, you, know, like you do in the gate lab here, uh, but this is primarily for the upper extremity. Um, so, you know, we know that the brain changes behavior. And we know that there's a huge role for stroke neurobiology, you know, all the changes that occur immediately after the stroke um, to lead to central reorganization. You know, there's a role for spontaneous recovery. There's clearly a role for rehabilitation. But exactly what or how do changes in muscles, in sensory input, in the pattern of movement and in social and emotional aspects of behavior, how do they change the brain, right? So that's uh, sort of what I've really been trying to get at. And um, patients clearly care about getting back to normal behavior. So really what I'm telling you is that I'm working on behavior. Uh, I'm not really going to present anything on exactly what's happening in the brain. If the behavior improves, we assume that all the changes in the brain are positive, right? But I can't tell you exactly what is changing. Uh, and a lot of my research has been driven by the questions from clinical practice. And my goal is to help address some of the questions that we have as clinicians through the research. Um, so what I've really found is that there are three main barriers that we face over and over again. One is that often, you know, at some point during the course of recovery, a patient may say, gosh, I'm too stiff to move. Um, and, you know, is it spasticity? What is this thing that they're talking about, muscle stiffness? And, you know, how do we treat them so that their function improves, you know, not just their spasticity or muscle stiffness? And second, many of our patients are too weak to move in the beginning, and then over time, the stiffness plus the weakness can uh, give rise to particular challenges. And so what therapy can they engage in then to change their pattern of movement? They often seem to be pushed in certain patterns. Um, and finally, even when patients can move, even when they have uh, the ability to, say, grasp a bottle of water, they don't often use that hand to do functional activities. Their dexterity is limited. So, uh, you know, what, what is it that's really missing? After all, they've recovered enough to be able to do this task somewhat, right? So these are some of the questions I'm going to address um, in the next hour or so. Uh, so this idea of stiffness and spasticity, you know, we have neurologists in the audience. It's been so hotly debated. You know, some people say, gosh, spasticity is not really an entity that, that affects motor control. And yet for many of us, it's a huge, you know, it's a real entity and we are constantly looking for ways to treat it. I have patients um, where I refer them to therapy and then the therapist says, you're so spastic, I can't even work with you. Go back to your physiatrist, right? Now what we know is that stroke disrupts the control to the spinal neuronal networks that ultimately lead to muscle activity and function, right? So the pathways that are often implicated in um, abnormal control are, um, are the brainstem pathways, some of which are excitatory and some of which are inhibitory. And these pathways ultimately control the stretch reflex, right? So the stretch reflex has been thought to be, you know, one of the main factors in the, um, uh, in the presentation of a spastic patient. And so the idea is that as a result of reduced descending uh, inhibitory input, 
you have an imbalance because uh, essentially there's lack of suppression of the stretch reflex. Okay? Uh, so when the muscle is stretched, there's afferent information that goes into the spinal cord. There's a monosynaptic uh, uh, connection here, and then it activates both the alpha motor neuron that makes the entire muscle contract and the gamma motor neuron that uh, controls the activity of the muscle spindle, which is your uh, sensory organ inside the muscle. Now, all of our treatments are really designed to suppress this quote-unquote muscle overactivity that seems to arise, right? So you can give botulinum toxin directly into the muscle and uh, make it weaker. You could do a dorsal rhizotomy, cutting off these afferent fibers that take information to the spinal cord. You can increase the suppression in the spinal cord interneural networks by giving intrathecal baclofen or central nervous suppressants. You can give nerve blocks. And the end result is that all of these can give some symptomatic relief, but they also give rise to um, weakness, right? Now, in my lab, I was seeing the same kinds of patients, and one of the most common problems we face is we have a patient who has a stiff wrist, right? Their, their wrist flexors are stiff or um, spastic, and so the tendency is to think, okay, the flexors are overactive, we've got to reduce the activity in the flexors. But when we actually measured the flexor activity during wrist extension in three groups of patients with stroke, those who were predominantly weak, those who you would call, you would call them uh, having a lot of spasticity or spastic co-contraction or minimal paresis, note that the wrist flexor activity was not really different. Right? What was really different in these patients was that the patients who seemed to be more spastic, where they were you know, contracting their flexors and extensors at the same time, potentially, during wrist extension, had more weakness. Right? So this whole idea of, you know, so would I want to inject Botox in the muscles of, in the wrist flexors here? Maybe to make this a little bit more active, but, you know, Perhaps not. And this has been a major clinical dilemma. Um, that it's been found by other people as well that the stretch reflexes, first of all, may not be overactive, um, and, or at least hyperreflexia is not associated with muscle stiffness. And initially, after a stroke, uh, a patient may be hyperactive, their reflexes may be overactive, but they may not be stiff at all. The stiffness actually progresses over time. Um, and all of our current treatment options also invariably exacerbate the muscle weakness that they have. Now, other people have recognized that, and they've proposed that you know, there are three kinds of muscle stiffness. There's the reflex-induced muscle stiffness that I've talked about that causes this overactivity. Um, but then there's also something called active muscle stiffness or shortening where somehow the muscle gets stuck in a shortened position. Okay? We don't quite really understand that. And then it, we do understand fibrosis or contracture when you, know, you passively you cannot get the muscle back into its original position. So as physiatrists and as clinicians you'd appreciate that you know, it's a balancing act. Um, we overtreat and we get issues. We undertreat and we still have lack of function, right? So how do we go about this? Um, so one of the key things that happened in uh, my clinical practice was, you know, I was doing randomized clinical trials on Botox, trying to adjust the dosage. I wanted to see, you know, how can we give it so we don't cause the weakness but still improve control? And um, I could convince myself, I could convince my patients, um, and once uh, this mother of a child that I had injected came and told me, you know, I had clearly documented, you know, she, at six weeks she was, the child was much better. And at 12 weeks, the mom said, you know, he's worse. And I said, no, he's better. You know, and it became this <laughs> little uh, uh, game that we were playing. And I decided that as part of standard of care, I've got to measure 
you know, I've got to document. And so now as standard practice, I actually videotape every patient during range of motion. It only takes five minutes, but I have this, you know, this um, data that is actually very valuable to even find out and to be on the same page with the patient. So um, now there's a lot of literature on the effects of Botox on muscles, okay? And um, what's been shown is that after a single dose of Botox, we think it wears off in about three months, but the data, uh, the histological data, and this is from a rabbit muscle, suggests that the, that the changes actually persist further, and the changes are not only in the injected muscle, but on the same muscle on the other side as well. Okay, so this has been kind of interesting um, that first of all it persists. So even at six months, the uh, muscle didn't look like the uh, pre injection muscle. Um, and then, you know, there are, if you give Botox every three months, um, you have all these fatty changes, which, you know, after repeated injections, you still have these changes. They're not more than they were at. Uh, uh, after the first set of injections, but you have persistent changes. Now, what happens if a person has been getting Botox every three months for the last five, six, seven, eight, ten years, right? Um, well, what's been shown is that clearly muscle strength is decreased compared to controls and remains decreased. Um, and when you stimulate the muscle directly versus when you stimulate the nerve, you clearly see uh, more weakness when you stimulate the nerve, which is understandable because Botox affects the discharge from the nerve uh, ending. But what was really interesting is that there's no change in muscle mass. Right? We seem to see the pseudo hypertrophy in some of our, ch in our, in our stroke patients, and we wonder, hey, that's an overactive muscle. Right? But what is it really? The muscle is weak. It's replaced by non-contractile tissue. Um, but where, what is this extra mass coming from? So really, we started to think about how does stroke alter muscle architecture? Okay? And um, you know, the muscle fiber is surrounded by a collagenous network made up of Endomysium, so endomysium is uh, this collagenous um, layer that surrounds each muscle fiber. And the muscle fascicle, which is the bundle of muscle, muscle fibers, is surrounded by perimysium, and then the entire muscle by epimysium. And so this is this, this collagenous network, along with everything that's between the muscle fibers, the extracellular matrix, um, you know, it, it all forms together, it's the extracellular matrix matrix, right? It's outside of the muscle fiber. And now what's been found is that this collagenous network made up of endomysium and perimysium is really important for force transmission. So force transmission doesn't occur just from the, uh, the sliding of the actin myosin filaments inside each muscle fiber, inside each sarcomere. That force that is generated has to be transmitted. Uh, across the muscle fibers to, 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 pull, uh, to, to change the length of the muscle. And uh, these collagen, this collagenous network plays a really important role in tr force transmission. Um, and what's been found it is, is that in chronic spasticity, it is these collagenous networks that are really thickened. Okay? And so at this point, you know, a person is the muscle has fibrosis, right? So you're heading towards a contracture. But interestingly, right around these collagenous networks, there is uh, a layer of some, of, a, of, a, of hyaluronan, a molecule called hyaluronan, which forms part of the extracellular matrix. Um, and you can see in muscle, you know, it's right around, you, here we are staining the brown is uh, hyaluronic acid binding protein. It's right around the endomysium, okay? And um, this fairly old study shows that when the rat ankle was immobilized, 
for a period of time, the hyaluronic acid actually increased in concentration. Okay, and they knew it was hyaluronic acid because it was washed out with hyaluronidase. Okay, so this was four weeks after immobilization, you see that there's a higher concentration of hyaluronic acid or hyaluronan, uh, the synonymous. But what happened is that at 12 weeks, the endomysium itself got thickened. Okay, so before the endomysium became thickened, at four weeks, you saw increased deposition of hyaluronic acid. So, you know, there are so many molecules out there in the extracellular matrix. Why hyaluronan? Okay. Um, well, hyaluronan, first of all, is present in all tissues. We know it best from the joint fluid, right? We know that it contributes to viscosity, and when you lose hyaluronan, it predisposes one to arthritis, right? So in muscle tissue, it's really important for sliding, and I'll tell you how, but the idea is that uh, it's present in muscle tissue, and it's a very large molecule, and when it accumulates, it actually changes the viscosity of the muscle tissue, okay? So it's typically, it's also hydrophilic, it absorbs water, okay? But when its concentration increases a lot, then the viscosity of the tissue increases so much that both lubrication and tissue sliding decrease. Okay? So uh, this biophysical property of hyaluronic acid seemed really interesting. Um, and so we know that when the viscosity increases, the, um, the, the shear wave velocity decreases. That means, you know, normally you can, when the muscle fibers slide against one another and there's a thin layer of hyaluronic acid around the endomysium, you know, your shear wave velocity could be pretty high. But then just imagine that this layer becomes thickened, you know, then your shear wave velocity decreases considerably. So we thought that maybe lack of mobility, um, weakness, um, after a stroke could lead to accumulation of this hyaluronan, which we know can happen, and can increase the viscosity of this extracellular matrix, eventually leading to muscle stiffness and reduced movement, right? And what's even more interesting is that um, in other tissues, like in the lung and the liver and the kidney, they've actually measured hyaluronic acid uh, before fibrosis occurs, and they found that when the concentration increases a lot, it's a signal of impending fibrotic changes, okay? Um, so the idea was that when you have hyaluronic acid accumulation, then it's potentially reversible muscle stiffness, but if you don't do anything about it, then the muscle could become fibrotic, and at that point, it's irreversible. Um, and so the idea was that there could be many factors that could potentially lead to muscle stiffness. Um, for example, immobilization, but perhaps there's a role for inflammation. You know, it's not clear. Um, and that could either lead to redu reduction in the degradation of HA or increased production and, um, you know, and then this casca cascade. Now, it so happens that there is an enzyme called hyaluronidase that's been on the market for more than 10 years. Um, it's been found to be fairly safe. It's FDA approved, um, and um, uh, it was available. So we got permission to use this in some of our patients who did no longer respond to Botox. We had no way to really treat them, and they were, uh, they were suffering. And uh, the idea was, could injection of hyaluronidase to reduce extracellular matrix viscosity potentially disrupt this vicious cycle of stiffness, um, lack of function, pain, eventually leading to fibrosis and contracture? Uh, so we gave it in uh, a number of muscles along the kinetic chain, and we measured range of motion like I always did in the clinic. And we looked at proximal joints, um, we looked at passive range of motion and active range of motion, uh, and we looked at it 
across four time points. Before the injection, within two weeks post-injection, most people seem to respond within about three days, and um, all the patients came back within about two weeks. We also looked at them within six to eight weeks and then three to five months. And, you know, notice that passive range of motion increased, which was great to see. But what was really exciting is that active range of motion started to increase, particularly in some people where we would not expect, you know, they were in the chronic stage post-stroke, we may not expect them to change dramatically at all. And we saw that even in the distal joints, right? And if you looked at the modified Ashworth scale, we saw a 100% reduction in muscle stiffness uh, for those who had pretty uh, severe increase in stiffness. They were not contracted, but you know, about 50, almost 40 to 50 percent of the joints had a modified Ashworth score of three, and that came down to almost zero. Right? So this was really interesting. Um, and we published these in 2016. Um, and I just want to show you an example here. So this was a young woman I had been treating with Botox for a few years prior. Um, and she, she could extend her wrist, but she could not flex. Okay? Um, and this was one week post-injection. For the first time, she has some wrist flexion. And then this is her two months post-injection where you know, she had pretty good control of the wrist, but also of all the other proximal joints. You know, this was the one that changed quite a bit. Now she actually has full hand function. Um, so up until this point, it was still a hypothesis. We couldn't really measure it, and it's very difficult to do um, pathologic studies you know, where you get tissue biopsies. So we were fortunate to uh, collaborate with someone who uses something called a T1 row MRI of the muscle. Um, and you can see that it's, it's measuring glycosaminoglycan content. The largest component of the glycosaminoglycan content is uh, from hyaluronic acid. And so there's quite a bit of hyaluronic acid in a normal muscle. But in the stroke-affected arm, and here we're looking at the upper arm, Notice that there's quite a bit of excessive hyaluronic acid, all this red. And look at the shape of the muscle. It's triangular, you know, as if the fibers are all stuck together. And then one week after injection, notice the change in shape of the muscle, right? So this is uh, still indirect evidence, but the first evidence that, you know, maybe on the right track. Uh, the pros and cons are it's a fairly simple injection uh, directly into the muscle, but it's very different from injecting Botox because you don't necessarily inject it into the belly. Um, and, um, and, you know, the selection of these points is a little tricky, something we've been figuring out. Okay? Um, so at least it doesn't cause any weakness, right? So we can, and what we've seen is this consistent increase in muscle um, in active range of motion, and now we're beginning to tease apart. We just have a, a, a R21 grant that's been funded where we can look at how it changes the reflexes, right? Is this, does it have anything to do with the stretch reflexes, or is this completely independent and uh, a peripheral thing? Because it, it could be that it changes the afferent input into the reflexes, right? Or it could be that it is a completely peripheral phenomenon independent of the central changes that are happening. And yet, you know, the changes in active range of motion and the type of recovery that we're seeing suggests that, you know, it could, excessive accumulation of hyaluronic acid could be some sort of an inhibitor of plasticity. You can't move, you can't change the brain. Now you can move, you can begin to effect changes, uh, you know, perhaps in, in the nervous system too. And we don't, you know, that's, we haven't begun to really measure that yet. So, um, so I'm going to move on to another topic now, right? Uh, and that is, 
you know, so maybe we can take away stiffness. But what if they're still weak? Right? And I always tell my patients, you know, we're, we're actually removing the resistance to movement. The, high, the injections are not restoring strength, right? Because uh, patients, if they, were, if they had some movement before, and actually it's the patients who did really well initially and then became stiff, that really show a great response to these injections because now they get their old movement back, which somehow they lost. Right? But if they have no movement at all, if they cannot activate the muscle at all, then you still need to activate the muscle. Uh, so what, what can you engage in if uh, someone has a really limited repertoire of movements? So, you know, we've been, um, one of our, the constructs that we base our rehabilitation on is that the two sides of the brain compete with each other, right? that you need to suppress the activity on the contralateral side because if you, or, or you have to take the unaffected arm out of the equation when you do therapy because you've got to practice with the affected arm. And that's the constraint-induced therapy model, right? And, um, you know, it's been shown, though, that after a stroke, the activity on the unaffected side of the brain increases, right? Is that good? Or is that bad? Uh, people think that it's bad because if you have persistent increase in activity on the unaffected side of the brain, that tends to correlate with uh, very severe patients who may not recover movement on the affected side, in the affected arm. But what's been shown is that if you need to have increased activity on the unaffected side of the brain to even down the road restore restore activity in the affected side of the brain, okay? So the thought is that perhaps the increased activity in the unaffected side of the brain is part of the repair mechanism to ultimately uh, change the connectivity of the brain to restore function, to restore activity on the effect, in the affected arm. And uh, some of these ideas came from some of our work. You know, it's been thought that movement of the fingers, particularly, is entirely controlled by the opposite side of the brain. Okay, the ipsilesional side has no role to play in the fine distal movements. But here, this is data from a patient where uh, this patient was able to move the fingers a little bit. Um, and on this side of the screen, I show he's, he's asked to move the thumb just the thumb alone, back and forth, and then the index finger and the middle finger and the ring finger, and you can see that you know, the movements wane off fairly rapidly. Now, it's the same patient performing the same movement with the same hand. The only difference is they are moving both sides simultaneously. Okay? But we are measuring from the affected side. And notice that the characteristics of the movements are quite different. right? So is the other side helping? What, what's really going on here? Um, and so we came up with this whole idea. You know, there's been a lot of literature. Of the bat rack work has been done over here. Um, and you know, the review um, of bimanual versus unimanual suggests that you know, there's really not much difference. Uh, if you force somebody to use uh, the affected side, uh, they may use it more, but the quality of movement may not necessarily get better. And of course, the vast majority of patients with stroke don't have enough movement to enable them to just use the affected arm alone, right? So you might do bimanual, um, but here the idea was, well, can we do bimanual, and then can we assess its effect on unimanual movements? Can there be some transfer of learning or control that changes the nature of the unimanual movement that follows this bimanual movement, right? And potentially, there, you know, there's the uncrossed pathway, the ipsilateral pathway, or there's, there's crossing over um, through the corpus callosum. You know, there are potentially pathways, which I'm not measuring, so I don't know, uh, that's a question for Dr. Selnick and his team. Um, but the idea is that um, 
perhaps if we can change the behavior, then maybe we can start to investigate the neural mechanisms. So what we did was we developed a set of devices where you can, with one arm, you can move the other. So basically the two arms are linked in such a way that you could, uh, let's say the good arm does wrist extension, the affected arm also does wrist extension at the same time. Okay, so in this way, there are no compensatory movements, right? You're training exactly the movement that you want. Um, and also, we wanted to train out of synergy movements, right? The idea was that if patients are internally rotated and flex at the elbow and the wrist and the fingers, you want to train the opposite. And um, so, uh, and the idea is here, the patient is able to engage in the movement by themselves. Okay, um, and so we did a little study using all these devices, um, and uh, there was a change in the Fugelmeyer score, and these were patients with chronic stroke. Uh, they said that, you know, they had better sensation um, in the affected arm. What was really interesting is they said their fingers were not as tight anymore and um, that they had a sense of control because they were now in charge of their movements, right, while they were on this device. But the problem was that it wasn't really very fun, it wasn't engaging. So since then, uh, we've uh, come a long way. We have a you know, much better looking device. We started off with the arm training because what we found was the vast majority of patients, you know, it's been shown also in the literature that a lot of the problems begin at the shoulder, right? Even though uh, patients have problems throughout the arm, um, they get tight in the pectoralis, okay, and they cannot externally rotate. And as you know, as many therapists know, if your arm, if your shoulder is internally rotated, there's not much you can do functionally, right? Because your forearm is in the wrong position, your hand is in the wrong position, your work space is limited. So the first idea was if we can get the, hand, the arm to be oriented in a functional position, then perhaps there's a chance, right? So the idea was we picked external rotation as the first movement, but we, um, in this device, we can also measure how external rotation changes forearm rotation and grasp and release. Okay, so there are sensors embedded in this device. And then it's interfaced with the video game that is, um, you know, a uh, straightforward rowing game, which I'll just show you. And you can, the patient gets feedback on how far they can move. And you can also move just one arm or both arms and begin to look at while they're moving, while they're training, you can uh, collect all of the data on movement in the background. And, um, so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so they're rowing a boat here. And we also have some other stimuli that can be used to examine the extent to which the affected arm learns more or less from using both arms together. Right? Uh, so for example, uh, okay, so I'm going to get to that. But in our Initial pilot study where patients use the device for only 12 sessions over a period of six weeks, what we were surprised to find that in extremely low level patients with Fugelmeyer scores of between four and 20, right, they, were, they, they still showed some degree of improvement in the Fugelmeyer score, particularly in the change in the flexor synergy component, which means that now they can isolate the elbow from the shoulder, making it easier to stretch their arm out to put on a coat, for instance. But more interesting in these really low-level chronic patients were the changes in active range of motion, both in the trained joint as well as the untrained joint movements that we saw. Right? Uh, so this was quite interesting to see in only 12 sessions. And now, with the new device, what we can do is we can measure um, joint range of motion as it's happening. We can look at the change in trajectory. Look at, we can look at the slope of the range of motion. And we can do it with different kinds of feedback, visual and auditory. 
right? So we can, uh, or a combination, or none. And so we can begin to understand how other systems, we know that motor control is just not motor control, it's sensory motor control, right? And we change the way we move based on what we hear and what we see. So here we can sort of probe exactly how patients learn and particularly how learning can improve with input from the unaffected side. And so this is some of our more recent data where the same patient, so again, this was their Fugelmeyer score, uh, relatively low here, and we, tr we, we had a, a phase where they just participated in conventional therapy, and we looked at the change in the Fugelmeyer score, and then we looked at the change with uh, the bimanual arm trainer. So you can see that overall, there was quite a significant difference. These are the same patients who went through a control phase and then a training phase. And then these are the changes in range of motion in, these, uh, in, in the same patients across these two phases, in the trained movements as well as the untrained movements. So what was most interesting, and I uh, forgot to put that slide in, was that frequency of training really has an important role to play. Right? So if you gave just 12 sessions over six weeks, the improvement was far less than if you gave the same 12 sessions over four weeks, right? which, uh, which again is very interesting. And we are beginning to try to probe that a little bit more. You know, when is more better and what, what exactly changes? Right? So the, this is some new data that uh, we're collecting. Um, so the exciting thing is... Um, Am I doing okay for time? Okay. So the exciting thing is if we can reduce stiffness and if we can restore some degree of active range of motion, now we have a little bit of hope. You know, Once we restore mo movement, perhaps then now we need, can ask the question, well, how can you improve control? Okay. Um, and actually, this is how I started my research career uh, with John um, back there, who you know well. So we started really looking at, um, you know, what are the components of hand function? Because hand function is complex. It requires an inherent flexibility or adaptability, right? So if I'm uh, grasping this bottle of um, water, I have to make sure I don't squeeze it too tight, right? I have to squeeze it just enough. Uh, and it's quite different if I'm lifting a, pl a, uh, a steel bottle, for instance, a metal bottle. Right? There, perhaps I'm more worried also about not dropping it. Right? So the forces have to be just right, not too much and not too little. So how do we know when to use the, just, uh, the right amount of force? And how do we know exactly what type of hand posture to use? Um, uh, how to modulate our forces according to different textures that we manipulate and to move our fingers individually? Right? So these are some of the questions I uh, started out asking. And one way to really examine this was using this little test device that was equipped with force sensors. So they're little sensors that you grasp, and you can change the weight of the object, and you can also change the texture at the fingertip interface. And what happens is that when a person touches this object, their grip force starts to increase. And after a short delay, they then start to increase their load forces, which means they are beginning to initiate activity in the muscles that are eventually going to help them lift the object. Right? So this delay actually represents the time taken to coordinate the grasping action with the lifting action. And then all of this is happening even before you actually lift the object off the table. Okay, all of this coordination and this device, uh, these four sensors allow us to really uh, get a window into that. And then we can look at the rate of change of the grip force, how fast it changes and how fast the load force changes. So what's been found is that in, in completely healthy individuals, it takes us only one lift to really get a good sense of the weight of the object. 
And you might have experienced this. If you open your refrigerator door and, you know, reach to grasp that carton of milk, right? Once in a while, you might, you know, get a little bit of a jolt when you realize, oh, wow, there's no milk left, right? Because, the, because you anticipate there is milk. You reach with a certain, uh, you anticipate that you're going to use a certain amount of force. And then you realize, oh, no, you know, there's no milk left. So it's the same thing. But the second time you go to grasp that carton, you're going to use just the right amount of force because you've learned, right? The same thing happens in healthy people. After the first trial, you see that the rate of change, the rate of change, the rate is much more sensitive. It's basically the slope of the forces. The rate of change of forces tells you, even before the object is lifted, whether a person is anticipating uh, to use less forces or more forces. Okay? And um, what is even more interesting is, let's say you've practiced with one hand, you've lifted that carton of milk with one hand, and now you open the next refrigerator door and you decide to use your other hand, right? You actually, everything that you've learned with one hand, you can use with the other hand on the very first time. You don't even need that practice lift, okay? So essentially, the other hand, access ha the other hand has access to all the learning that one hand seems to have experienced. And that's what this graph shows you. Okay, so the unpracticed hand. And uh, now, this is not just true for a light or heavy weight. It's very finely graded for a range of weights. And so this metric is uh, very linearly related to uh, the weight of the object. And similarly, the rate of change of grip force uh, changes according to the friction or the texture of the grip surface. Um, so overall, if you look at uh, a patient, uh, a healthy patient, you see this behavior. In a patient with stroke, even if they grasp and lift the object several times, you may not see this behavior, right? So we started to probe, you know, why, and can the other hand help you, right? So actually, this is where we first got the clue that, you know, first of all, we saw that the patients, despite uh, a modest number of trials, in this case it was only five trials, we found that they really could not uh, change their fingertip forces according to the weight of the object. But if they lifted the object five times with the unaffected hand, and then with the affected hand, on that very first trial with the affected hand, they could change the way they manipulated this object, which was quite interesting. Right? Because it means there's some information that they don't get when they repeatedly practice with that affected hand. But that information, if you provide that information as a result of practice with the unaffected hand, you can change performance. Okay. Um, and so we started to probe a little deeper. And uh, we asked, you know, how does it change muscle control? Because that's what, we also, that's what we want to change, right? The forces are the behavior, and it's the muscle activity that's leading to this behavior, so we wanted to understand that. And what we saw was that in a healthy subject, the difference between lifting a light object and a heavy object was really seen in the lifting muscle. So in this case, we had asked them to lift the weight by flexing the shoulder, right? So the anterior deltoid showed higher activity for the uh, heavier weight compared to the lighter weight, and that was very well correlated with the change in the load force rate. But in patients with stroke, even though they were also lifting the light and the heavy activity, the signal from the anterior deltoid was missing. Instead, there was a much higher signal in other muscles, right? Suggesting that, hey, wait a minute, they're supposed to lift, they're lifting the object with elbow, uh, with shoulder flexion, but you're not seeing the same relationship between, uh, in the, the signal in the muscle is not from the lifting muscle. Okay, all these other muscles seem to want to help, right? Uh, so can we even restore the pattern um, to the control pattern. And so what we found was that if a patient used the unaffected hand to practice and then the affected hand, 
then at least for you know one trial, and that's that's the that's the caveat, right? We could see this relatively normal pattern, right? Suggesting that it's possible, but now you know what kind of training strategy do we use to actually make this more permanent? Um, so, uh, so I'm I'm going to skip a few things, but really what we did this was a, a, a study where we measured the uh, fingertip force prediction and grasp execution. And grasp execution, as I had mentioned a few slides earlier, is the time taken from touching the object to actually exerting forces in the vertical direction, right? So it's the coordination between the gripping muscle and the lifting muscle. And that coordination occurs so quickly. It's only 100 milliseconds in a normal person and even in the unaffected hand, it's really short. But look, in a patient with stroke, it can take up to two seconds, right? So that can really delay the time taken to manipulate objects, and that's what's been shown. This preload phase duration that we can measure is correlated with the time taken to do your um, Jepson Taylor or the Wolf motor or any functional task, right? So if you can reduce that, you can potentially uh, something is changing in terms of the control. So in this study, we just had um, a, a therapist worked with us to train patients to use the unaffected side before they use the affected side. So it was alternate hand, right? Um, every, before you use the unaffected, uh, the affected hand, first grasp the object with the unaffected. And after four weeks of training, you know, one hour of training each day, um, we saw that there was this change in their ability to anticipate the light and heavy weights. There was a change in the time taken uh, for coordination or the preload phase duration. And uh, we also saw a number of changes in their sensitivity, right? So pressure, sensitivity threshold, the stereognosis, static two-point discrimination, pinch strength increased, lots of things changed, suggesting that maybe this is a viable training strategy. But, and I'm going to skip over a little bit, but not all patients are the same, right? And here what we're showing is that um, we also, we did a study where we looked at the corticospinal tracts on the affected side and on the unaffected side. And what we found was that this change in the preload phase duration, which is functionally very relevant, was related to, was correlated with the, uh, the axonal density in the contralateral corticospinal tract, in the intact corticospinal tract, right? Suggesting that, you know, if your other, the corticospinal tract of your intact side is also affected, so if you have much more extensive stroke, uh, then potentially this would not be a good strategy, training strategy for these patients. So what we have been able to do now is, you know, how is a therapist to know which strategy to use? Are they learning or are they not learning, right? It's difficult. It's a black box unless you can measure it. So what we've done now is we've uh, created the um, tools, so we've created a grip instrument that can be used in a therapeutic setting, and it is interfaced with, um, uh, with a display which can actually tell you uh, whether the fingertip forces are abnormal with the affected hand and the extent to which they become more normal with alternate hand training, right? So, for example, in this cohort of uh, patients, it was abnormal with the affected hand, but it became more normal with the affected hand after the unaffected hand. Now, in some patients, it remained abnormal, right? And so in these patients, you know, it was abnormal, but it remained abnormal. Perhaps no strategy will work. Perhaps they just don't have the neural substrate, right? And then there could be other patients who get worse if they use the other hand, in which case the constraint-induced uh, way might be the way to go for them, right? So in other words, there isn't a one-size-fits-all strategy, but if only we could know, then we could select the right strategy for the right patient. Um, and so, so this is where we are. Uh, to summarize, 
you know, this whole idea of stiffness is a real problem for clinicians, uh, but it seems that it, it's a separate entity from spasticity and that, you know, changes in the chemical composition of the muscle could play a role in this and we can actually begin to change that now. Um, and, you know, we could perhaps increase muscle activation by borrowing strength from the unaffected side. We kind of know that, and yet we also don't know it because we don't know exactly how to actually make it happen in reality, right? Because if a patient, in a patient with stroke, we already know that they are overusing the, the uh, unaffected side. They depend on the unaffected side. But how do you transfer that activity to the affected side is the key question. And then finally, it seems that sensory feedback and substitution of some information from the unaffected side can lead to changes in control in the affected side to improve dexterity. So, um, so I'm going to leave you with these thoughts, and I'd like to acknowledge all the people who've helped us uh, do all of this work, um, including my collaborators and the funding sources. So thank you very much. Yes. Yes. It was only, yeah, sorry. I'm going to repeat the question. So the video I showed, uh, I showed the video at uh, one week after the injections and then two months. She only got one set of injections. And that was between the baseline that I showed you and the one week. So it was the... It was only one set of injections, and then she was doing what she was normally doing. Um, so in her case, we injected a whole range of muscles. Um, so definitely it involved the wrist flexors as well as the extensors. So that's the key thing because, you know, we're not, we, we're, we're injecting agonists, antagonists, and synergists. Yes. How many patients? Um, in for the injected or in general? In my studies. So in my studies, we make sure that um, all patients can comprehend. So none of them have severe aphasia, right? Um, some of them have expressive aphasia, right, but all of them comprehend. Um, I can't really tell you the, so in some of the early studies, they were mostly right-handed, uh, right hemiparetic patients with left brain damage. So uh, at some point, they perhaps had language dysfunction. Um, but all of the later studies I'm showing you have both left and right hemiparetics. So some of them clearly have language impairment. Yeah. 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 I, I haven't measured. It is an intriguing thought, but I actually don't know. Yeah. So in the initial studies, you know, we were, they lasted, it lasted for at least three to five months, right? But that was the window that we waited. Um, what I find now is that I've injected more than 100 patients, um, that, that the injections are cumulative, right? Now, I do tell, and this is part of my standard uh, of care, I give everybody range of motion exercises to do. Right, I pretty much I give them a handout. Right, these are the exercises you can do by yourself. Here's a stick. You know, this is how I want you to move your shoulder, your forearm, your wrist. Uh, stretch your fingers this way. So, um, the, it doesn't wear off the way Botox wears off. If I give an injection once and I give it again at three months, it's the results that I see are additive. Right. Um, if I give it at a shorter interval, uh, uh, also it's additive. 
which therapy? Oh, the one with the bi-manual? Yeah, so it was time matched. So during the so conventional therapy was basically so people were at different. We did not actually provide conventional therapy. We the con, the control period was whatever they were doing, right? So some of them uh, and so we they they filled out logs. So if they were going for therapy, they continued to go for therapy. If they were doing a home exercise program, they continued to do that, right? So I can't tell you exactly what I know what each person was doing. Uh, but it was highly variable. So there's no new, I'm just doing the intervention, not the bilateral. In that one case, they're not showing bilateral treatment versus bilateral. No. It was to show bilateral versus. Versus bilateral whatever, bilateral. exactly. Right. Yeah. Standard versus life is more like it. Yeah. Correct, absolutely. Yes, we, we want to know that. Yeah. But you know, it's very hard to control, as you know. In rehab studies, there's a control, the control intervention also has an effect, but the control intervention may not be practical, right? So uh, it's actually tricky to design. So we've got to work out things like dose, I mean, you know, even. What that means, actually, to, to put it on the nose, you want to know exactly what you're trying to, what's the ingredient that you're trying to address. Exactly. So what you think is actually happening. And, and yes. I, if you understand the ingredient that you are trying to address, then you want to put control that actually is none of that. Correct. And that's actually what we're trying to do, understand the ingredients, including the dosage of the ingredient, right? Because if you don't know the dosage, then Yes. Absolutely. And I think it's probably it's ironic, isn't it, that you do all this tech and you do all these new ways and then you keep using these clinical scales as an outcome method, right? And, I, and as I said to you in the first morning, the people in my Delta, we have no idea what's happening. Exactly. And, and it would be nice to see some belief on our understanding, some functional scales, what the big lab looks like, what the Yes, I didn't. I have it, though. And, and also, I really suspect that these small changes in fever mile are probably a little bit of learning, a little bit of joint mobility, and to evoke all this transcomodal, I mean, all that interhemispheric stuff, you know, I'm very honest, it was all rubbish. Um, and I think that it's basically far too much neural explanation for what's probably some jitter around the system, both peripheral and central. If we're going to start invoking these very impressive neural mechanisms, let's get some big effect sizes. Put two or three points on the b wire, and everyone does it, you do it too. They change their y-axis so it's not at zero, right? Um, I think it's just, we should just admit that the small b wire changes should be interpreted with other measures and stop over-interpreting them neurally. You're absolutely right. Uh, and, you know, and the, and the thing is, I think that, and as you said, you know, you can instantly change the Fugelmeyer score by putting them in, an, you know, in a different, by supporting the weight of the arm, right? So, uh, the, what do the, so clearly, you know, what we do know, so the Fugelmeyer score or the Fugelmeyer scale came from Twitchell's observation that stroke patients tend to move in characteristic patterns, and that led to the brunstorm stages of recovery. What we see that over and over again. Patients move in stereotypical patterns, right? But when you want to make a change in that pattern, what should you look at? <laughs> 
right? Should you look at the change in the stereotypical pa pattern, but then you don't know exactly what is leading to that change. I will admit, we have no idea, and it's true, I'm not measuring anything in the brain. I am, you know, just speculating about what could be happening. I'm really, you know, so it's possible that all the changes are entirely peripheral, right? I mean, the periphery is very important. Um, so I cannot comment on, on, on the central changes. Only, one can only assume that central changes are happening if peripheral changes are going in the right direction. And I think that's what we care about, that the peripheral cha whatever changes there are, they go in the right direction. And then, you know, so I'll tell you why I'm excited about this whole bimanual is first of all, you know, Movement is key, right? We know that experience is really important, right? You, if you, what happens to vision if you blindfold during a critical period? You lose vision, right? If you stop moving, and, and this is your work, John, if you don't move during that critical window in the acute phase, then maybe you'll never move, right? Because you're not, uh, you're not providing the experience to stimulate the changes in the brain. But, so that's the problem that we face. There is no way to get the patient to move in the right way. And the whole idea of the technology is only to help facilitate that, right? And then we can begin to measure changes in the brain. And we need to do that. We need to measure it. Uh, and I think that's where I'd love to collaborate with uh, Dr. Selnick's lab and you know, figure out what's really happening, what's changing, how are the con how's the connectivity changing. Um, we do need to get at that. Well, there needs to be injections. Yeah. Did you measure the fecal matter change? Dr. No. Why not? Now, you would probably have gotten the fecal matter change. Maybe you would have gotten the fecal matter change at the risk. Yeah. Well, because, because that, was done, uh, that was done in the clinic. I, it was not a research study to begin with. Yeah. I would have, and I definitely will. I expect to get it, right? Nothing to do with the brain at all. It has nothing to do with the brain, exactly. We don't really know what's happening in the brain, I will admit, right? And I, and I said that in the beginning as a disclaimer, but thank you for bringing the point home. <laughs> yes, Stacy. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you all.